For the Japanese and some of these young men, this began in the middle of the 1850s. It's so hard for us to understand, but they go right back to when the Americans first arrived on Japan's shores. That was Christopher Harding speaking about the motivations of kamikaze pilots. John Smith, more than any other individual of the period, ended up uh, making North America become part of the English-speaking world rather than um, allowing the Spanish and the Dutch and the French from expanding. And that was Peter Firstbrook on Captain John Smith's contribution to British history. You're listening to the History Extra podcast from BBC History magazine. We're the UK's best-selling history magazine, available from all good news agents or via subscription. Check out our latest subscription deals at historyextra.com forward slash subscribe. The magazine is also now available on many digital devices, including the iPad, iPhone, Kindle, Kindle Fire, Google Play, Kobo and Zinio. Look out for us in your app store or newsstand or find out more at historyextra.com forward slash digital. Hello and welcome to our third podcast of December 2014. I'm Rob Attar, the editor of BBC History magazine. Ever since the Second World War, the Japanese kamikaze pilots, who flew thousands of missions against Allied ships, have been viewed as crazy fanatics engaged in a desperate but futile attempt to change the course of the conflict. But how much do we truly know about the mindsets and motivations of these young men? One historian who is seeking to change our understanding of the kamikaze pilots is Christopher Harding of Edinburgh University. Chris has written a piece on the subject for the Christmas issue of BBC History magazine, and I also had a chance to speak to him a few weeks ago to find out more. I started by asking Chris when and why the kamikaze attacks began. They began um, towards the end of 1944. First ones occurred in October 1944. Context is quite important because Japan was really starting to lose the war quite badly um, at this point. The Americans had been doing this island hopping campaign. They were getting closer and closer to the Japanese home islands. The military was starting to get very, very desperate, doing everything they could basically to prevent an American invasion of the home islands. The point of the kamikaze attacks was basically that American radar was thought to be so good that attacks, conventional attacks from the air wouldn't really work because the um, aircraft, the Japanese aircraft would be shot down long before they got to their targets. Instead, with the kamikaze attack, if you can skim the water at quite a low level, you can avoid American radar um, almost up until the last minute. And this basically uh, was the plan. You can both take out as many American vessels as possible, but you can also send a message. The message being basically that the cost in American lives of trying to take the Japanese home islands would be unthinkable and would be something that the American leadership couldn't really sell to its population back home. So the basic idea of the kamikaze attack is that the pilot just flies the plane into a ship, hopes to destroy it, and in the process will almost certainly be killed himself. Absolutely, yeah. So you've got, you've got two types. Either you've got a conventional plane where they just stuff lots of explosives into the nose and they take out most of the rest of the plane, everything that you didn't need, obviously only fuel it up for um, a single journey. And as you say, the expectation would be that the pilot absolutely wouldn't come back from that. Second type of plane, um, even more so, it was basically a kind of, almost a torpedo that would be dropped out of another plane and then would be direct at the American vessel um, from a certain height, the so-called Orca, or the cherry bombs, kind of ironically named. Um, and again, no expectation at all that the pilot would come back. I think it's worth putting it in a bit of perspective, though, because these pilots, although this was a special kind of attack and they were called special attack forces, it was already in the Imperial Army manual that Japanese soldiers ab- absolutely should not surrender and should not put themselves in a position where they would be captured. So for Japanese pilots involved in this, it was death in combat. It wasn't suicide in the way that you or I might think of it. Obviously it must have been, if you were on American, I I believe even there were a few British ships as well, it must have been a terrifying experience to have a kamikaze attack, but how effective were they actually? Did they come anywhere close to achieving the Japanese aims for this mission? 
I think early on they were fantastically uh, successful, partly because there was the element of surprise. People had no idea that this kind of attack was going to be coming. But I think after a while, Americans in particular managed to get their radar systems adjusted. They managed to prepare for these sorts of attacks. They were very good at, at putting out fires and dealing with damaged parts of ships. So I think in the end, something like um, around 11, 12 percent of these kamikaze attacks ended in a successful hit. And even a successful hit, mind you, wouldn't necessarily be able to sink or damage an American ship completely beyond repair. I think it's somewhere around 400 American vessels were quite severely damaged or completely put out of action. But that's against the loss of more than 3,000 planes, around 4,000 Japanese lives. And towards the end, these attacks were starting to be seen as just desperate. Whereas at the beginning, the, the Japanese media, uh, although by that point the media was very limited in what it could get away really with, with, with printing, um, but the Japanese media celebrated these young people as being kind of the epitome of Japanese heroism. But I think towards the end, and certainly after the war when the media was freed up, these attacks were seen as being just a tragic and a disgusting waste of Japanese lives. You mentioned earlier that it was seen as part of death in combat. It wasn't just a suicide mission, but clearly anybody undertaking this mission was almost 100% likely going to die. So do they have to force pilots to fly these planes in that case? At the beginning, these were supposed to be volunteer missions. And what's, what's quite striking is that the, the rate of volunteering was very, very high. Um, but by the end, I think something like only two out of three pilots would actually have volunteered. The rest would basically have been, have been forced into it. And it's interesting, one of the things that the pilots would be given before they got on their planes was a, a decent-sized flask of wine. And some of these pilots, I mean, a lot of this is speculation. It's very hard to know about the state of mind of many of these pilots just at the end. But for a few of them, um, they were drunk in their bases, drunk when they were on their planes. And as some of the diary material they've used for, for this piece shows, they really were terribly traumatized, desperately trying to rationalize what was about to happen to them. But again, just a, I suppose a, a quick bit of context that if you were to get as a, as a young man, if you were to get your call up papers to go uh, to the front as an infantryman, for example, in late 1944, early 1945, that call up paper in itself was pretty much a death sentence. People weren't ignorant at home in Japan about how the war was really going. Of course, the Japanese media, the radio would be telling them one thing, but they knew anecdotally that this war was going badly wrong. And if you were called up at a late stage in the war, your chances of coming back were really not very good. So the kamikaze were just a kind of distillation of those tiny chances of coming out of the war intact. So really, if you volunteered to be a kamikaze pilot, you were just selecting this form of death instead of another one? I think so. It's an interesting way of putting it. Yes, and the, one of the Japanese words that gets used for this is a word called uh, jiketsu, which means self-determination. And you could contrast it to the conventional word for suicide, which is jisatsu, which is self-killing. And for a lot of these pilots, this was much more about jiketsu. It was about a, a certain amount of choice in the way that they um, would meet their end. And for a lot of these young men, they'd grown up never knowing any other life other than one in a country that saw itself as being at war, saw itself as being basically squeezed by the Americans uh, and the British and having to do whatever it could to fight back. And so these young men had grown up fully expecting that their lives would be taken up and possibly ended in the context of this huge apocalyptic struggle that was all around them in the media, in the education, in the way people talked on the street. And so yeah, you could say almost uh, at this last moment, they had a tiny element of self-determination, a tiny element of choice to say, this uh, is how I want to go out. Well, what did they see as, the, I know it's a strange word, but the benefits of, of doing this? What, did they think they'd be rewarded in the afterlife? Did they, would it bring honour on their family, things like that? Yeah, there were some of them who did think there would be benefits in the afterlife. There's a thing called um, Eide, which means a kind of spirit um, of, the, of the war dead or a war god even. There were some of them who, who genuinely thought that, that that was what would happen to them. It's part of the kind of mythology that's around at the time. It's kind of a uh, Shinto religion, but made into something like a very powerful political ideology with the emperor at the head of this kind of quasi-spiritual family. That if you did make that kind of sacrifice, then your soul or your spirit after the war would would be rewarded in that way. Um, others thought about it more in terms of protecting their families, trying 
at all costs to prevent this American invasion of the homelands, which they really feared. And again, this was whipped up in the media. If the Americans were to land, there would be random killings, there would be rapes, there would be all sorts of violence against the Japanese people and against their homeland. That if these young pilots were able to do anything towards preventing that outcome, then that would be, as it were, a huge benefit to them. I think one, one other part of it, possibly, this is hard to imagine ourselves back into their way of thinking, but they weren't considering themselves purely as being individuals, so much as someone's brother, or someone's son, or even someone's father, so that if they were to die in the context of a kamikaze attack, something of themselves was still living on, and was having a better chance of having a good life as a result of the sacrifice that they were making. And even these in the Japanese media, and Japanese psychotherapists, they were really working on people like this. They were saying, stop thinking about the individual person as being the most important social unit, or even unit of being, if you want to be philosophical about it. Instead, think about the family, think about the nation as being the primary unit. So the death of individuals really is of relatively little consequence in the bigger picture. And I think a lot of people were genuinely sold on that bigger picture. So the idea of your own death becomes that little bit easier to bear. How much of it do you think is unique to Japanese culture? Because I think some people in the West have a view that there's something a bit alien about the way of Japanese way of life that made people want to be kamikaze pilots and that no one here in the West would ever do something similar. Or do you think actually that's not true? Maybe in similar circumstances, people in Europe and America might have behaved in a similar way. I think the analogy I might draw is with young men in their late teens and early 20s in Britain now. And young men in their late teens, early 20s, 100 years ago, when they were in this rush to sign up to go and fight uh, in the Great War. I think it's not so much about something that is intrinsic to a culture as about something that's intrinsic to a moment. I think it's for all that we're doing to commemorate the First World War, I think it's very hard for us actually to imagine, especially as young people, young men and women, how they might feel if their country was facing what seemed like a genuine existential threat and how quick they would be to offer their services and to risk their lives for it. Obviously, we have our armed forces now and the young men and women in, in that do that all the time, do that every day. But for the rest of us, it's quite hard to imagine um, the pressures of a moment where we might think, yes, this is what I want to do. This is so important that it trumps every other aspiration I have for my life. And if you can think yourself back or try to, to Japan in this particular period, I think we could explain quite a lot about how young men signed up to become kamikaze pilots. I certainly don't think that it's anything in the blood or in the culture in some essentialist sense. And I think that's a, an interpretation that really comes from American and British war propaganda of the time, that the Japanese, you know, are almost a, a different species. I think as far as possible, we want to turn our backs on that and think instead of the pressures of a particular moment, which is so hard to reimagine, but we, I think, must try our best to do that. And of course, when the kamikazes were attacking, we, they were obviously forfeiting their own lives, but also potentially they could kill quite a few people in their action on the American or, say, British ships. Did any of them have any qualms about the fact that in their own death, they would also be killing many other people? That's a good question. If you look through the diaries, you see two or three different points of view on that. Some of these Japanese uh, kamikaze poets were writing to their, their family saying, I will try, basically, and take out as many Americans as I possibly can. And others were saying, this just seems to me like a, a pointless act. I'm going out there to kill people who are just like me, young men who are just my age, who have had the same sorts of experiences as I've had, the same sorts of aspirations for their lives in the future, you know, to meet someone, to get married, to have a family. It seems so pointless that I would do this. But again, I think the analogy that we're all thinking about at the moment, the Great War, it's exactly the same. I mean, you have young British boys killing young German boys who are remarkably similar to them. This great story that we all love of the football match that allegedly gets played between the British and the Germans, I mean, I think that just says it all. Take a moment out from facing each other uh, across no man's land, and actually we are exactly the same sorts of people. So that was there in the thinking of the kamikaze pilots, but we shouldn't deny the other side of it, which was, if I'm going to sacrifice my life and our military hardware, I'm going to make it count as far as I possibly can. How common would it have been for a kamikaze pilot to deliberately just, say, fly into sea, so kill themselves, but, but then avoid killing other people with them? 
I think, to be honest, that's very hard to know uh, because of the very limited information we have about how many of these kamikaze uh, attacks ended. I think the fact that we have evidence of enough of them doing this is quite important. And some of the information we have from uh, how they behaved on bases beforehand, what they said into their radios before they went down, we have just a little bit on that which, which tells us something. Others, though, the difficulty is if the plane goes into the sea, it's quite hard to know whether that is a moral choice that they've made, whether they've lost control of the aircraft, whether, in fact, they've just completely panicked at the last minute and have not been able to think about what they're doing at all. Don't forget these planes with the amount of high explosives that they had packed into the noses are very, very hard to control, particularly towards the end. So to interpret what uh, a plane landing in the sea actually means is, I think, really, really quite hard. Am I right to say that actually one or two of the kamikaze pilots did end up surviving for whatever reason? And, and have any of them ever talked about their experiences? Some of them did because they had technical trouble with their planes. Towards the end of the war, it was quite difficult to keep these planes in, in good working order, and, and, so, and so they came back. But then many of them would actually, again, find themselves stuck inside a plane trying again. The few of them that did survive the war for a long time didn't want to talk about it. And um, still, that tends to be um, the case now. There's a wonderful film, Eternal Zero, made in Japan, I think, last year, and it's just coming out around now in, in the UK, based around grandchild of a Zero pilot who tries to get the information out of him just towards the end of his life, because for decades and decades and decades, people just simply didn't want to have um, these sorts of conversations. But you, you've done a lot of research in the kind of writings and diaries and letters that the kamikaze pilots left, obviously, before their mission, and what kind of insights did that give you into their mindset? I think it balances out the image that we tend to have in the West of, of fanatics, people who weren't really thinking for themselves. Um, the, the person who's done the, the most important research on this is a woman called Emiko Onoki Tierney, who was the first to say, look, there are these memoirs out there, these diaries out there. Why aren't we looking at them? Why aren't we talking about them? Um, and she really has helped us bring to light the complexity of people's thinking on the one hand, but also something else that you see in these diaries that I think is so interesting is the time frame in which these young men thought about what they were doing. I suppose for us, this was a conflict that for the British began in 1939, for the Americans in, in you know, 1941 with Pearl Harbor. For the Japanese, um, some of these young men, this began in the middle of the 1850s. It's so hard for us to understand, but they go right back to when the Americans first arrived on Japan's shores, a guy called Commodore Perry. And the Americans turned up actually in a very aggressive spirit. Commodore Perry had been reading in New York Public Library about how you deal with the Japanese because of their so-called mentality. He said, you have to demonstrate to them that you mean business. Uh, they appreciate acts of power rather than words. And he landed on Japanese shores with a bunch of his soldiers and sailors, the kind of bulkiest men he could find. And he said to them, look, we want trade with you. We want diplomatic relations with you. I'll give you a year to think about it. But before we leave, let me leave you this little piece of white cloth. He said, because if we come back in a year's time and you tell us no, there's going to be a conflict and you'll be needing this to surrender with. And for a lot of Japanese young men in 1944, 1945, this was the kind of thing they thought that they were fighting. And in the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunals in 1946, people said, look, the Americans began this with this aggressive attitude towards Japan. They built up in Japan this sense of an apocalyptic struggle. Japan had been cornered into fighting. And the kamikaze pilots saw themselves in that long, long timeline that they were just the people who happened to have been born into the last couple of decades. And it was their destiny to fight the final few months of this conflict. So they didn't really see themselves as having the degree of self-determination and control that you or I might have expected, because this was a, a story that had been written for them, and they were just doomed, as it were, to play this part just towards the end. And that is the deep sense that you get from these diaries that I don't think you get anywhere else. Do you have a feeling from reading these diaries and letters who they were actually writing for? Because obviously these people knew they were actually going to die quite soon. Were they expecting someone, maybe their families, to then read them? Certainly they wanted their families to understand their state of mind towards the end. It was, uh, often it's for mothers primarily, now and again for brothers and sisters. Interestingly, fathers don't feature all that much um, in the diaries. I think that they were also about 
young men trying to work out what they thought of the situation. I mean, there is a lot of, there's a lot of very good poetry in there. There's also a lot of very bad poetry of the sort that adolescents and people in their young 20s anywhere in the world might write because they are going between having a kind of grand vision of world history all neatly worked out with their place in it one minute to the next moment thinking actually I have no idea what this is all for and I just find myself literally shaking um, in sheer panic so on the one hand yes it's definitely for their families it's a good buy it so this is how I see this being meaningful and I'd like you to share my sense of why this might be meaningful but on the other hand it's trying to work it out for themselves and very often they simply fail and you have to feel for them in a situation like that how do you possibly rationalize a what you're about to do but b this huge time frame in which you're being encouraged to consider it I'm just moving on now to the present day how are these kamikaze pilots and what they did viewed in Japan in the 21st century? I suppose in two different sorts of, of, of ways. One is part of a, a moment in Japanese history from which Japanese people would like to think the country has entirely moved on. Partly the Americans helped the Japanese with this because they produced this brand new constitution for the Japanese. They basically strong-armed the Japanese into this brand new pacifist constitution, a liberal democracy, women given the vote. They helped Japanese people think that August 1945 was the drawing of a very firm line under these events. And so to an extent, Japanese can think about the kamikaze attacks as being something from an entirely different world. And if you go to Japan now and you start to talk to people about this after a few drinks, they will say this was an entirely different universe, both for Japan but also for you in Britain. There was bad leadership on both sides. There were cruel decisions made on both sides. We are now a different country. We are now a different people. And as you know, that makes things quite difficult in East Asia because the Chinese and the Koreans would say, actually, before you decide to be a new people, to draw uh, a line, to turn a new page, we would actually like some recognition. We'd actually like a kind of apology. On the other hand, when people do consider it as kind of a live historical event, it's, it's tragic because of, of, of the waste of these young men. And more and more you get Japanese drama, uh, dramas being made um, about these men. And it always focuses on the human angle, how there was tragedy, how these young men were made to be victims, how families were trying to pull through despite the odds. Um, and in a way, that's understandable and it, it's colorful and there's a big human element there. The trouble is, though, I think that if you look at those events purely in that light, you fail to address the issue of responsibility. You fail to say, well, how is it that ordinary people allowed the military to take over the nation's politics, to capture the nation's hearts? And how is it that the war was allowed to drag on for as long as it was? When really, in the middle of 1943, certainly by early 44, the thing should have been brought to an end. So I think there probably is still a failure to ask those difficult political questions in Japan. And I wonder whether they're ever really going to manage to do it. And sort of in terms of the rest of the world, and I suppose particularly America, because they, they suffered the brunt of these attacks, is there, do you think, a growing understanding of the complexity of the Japanese kamikaze pilot experience? I'm not entirely sure that there is. There were these films, you know, the Clint Eastwood films that were made about the American and Japanese soldiers, which tried, I mean, they also drew on Japanese soldiers' um, writings and diaries that tried to show both sides. And again, as I say, Emig Ornegi, Tierney's publications, Don, they're more academic publications, but they're you know, brilliantly well written. These have had a certain impact. But I, I think the heroic narrative suits American purposes too well and it's too much embedded in the kind of national myth the way probably the great war is for us in britain that i don't think people necessarily want to reconsider these things i've i spoke to a, a friend of mine in, in japan who took a year out in um, in america uh, just you know just, just just to work and study for a while and she said you could be in a supermarket and people would come up to you and they would grill you on pearl harbor and they would grill you on the kamikaze and she would say look i'm 17 years old i don't know anything about these things i don't consider myself to have any kind of relationship with these things and yet this is still what you associate japan with i think it's just too vivid a story and it just suits America's view of uh, itself at a certain level, to put it crudely at least, um, that 
I don't think there's much appetite for looking at these things again. And I'd say just to balance it out, in Japan there isn't much appetite either. The way they organize the history curriculum in Japan for, for people at school is that they do it crudely chronologically. They start at the beginning and so rather conveniently by the time you get to the Second World War, they have to rush it because there isn't much more time. And that really helps teachers not to have to go into these difficult questions and these difficult issues. The difficulty there though I think is that if the situation in East Asia um, hots up, you know, tensions between China and Japan. There aren't enough people in Japan who really remember how and why it went wrong last time to prevent it going wrong again this time, which I think is a really big worry. That was Christopher Harding of Edinburgh University. Christopher has also made regular appearances on BBC Radio 3's Free Thinking. And as I mentioned earlier, Chris has written a piece on the kamikaze in the Christmas issue of BBC History magazine, which is on sale now. Also in this month's edition, we explore the controversial reign of Mary Tudor, we examine the early British settlers in America, and we introduce some of Egypt's most influential female pharaohs. You can get hold of the magazine in all good news agents and digitally, and now is also a great time to take out a subscription. If you're in the UK, you'll get to choose a fantastic free history book when you subscribe, including new accounts of The Wars of the Roses, Thomas Cromwell and Waterloo. To take advantage of this deal, please visit historyextra.com forward slash subscribe. And it will be available for a limited time only. Now it's time for the latest history news with our website editor, Emma McFarden. Almost 500 years after it sank, Henry VIII's flagship, the Mary Rose, is being used to help modern medicine. The remains of the sailors who were on board the ship, which sank in July 1545 in the Battle of the Solent, are being analysed as part of a study into bone disease. Researchers hope to better understand the historical causes of conditions like rickets in a bid to help doctors diagnose patients in the future. Hundreds of men aboard the ship drowned and only around 25 survived. The ship was discovered in May 1971 and raised in 1982. In other news, British and German soldiers are to recreate the football match reputed to have been played during the 1914 Christmas truce on the Western Front. The teams will be led out by soldiers dressed in First World War uniforms, the Telegraph reports, and the crowd will hear a bilingual rendition of Silent Night, the Christmas carol said to have been sung during the truce. The commemorative game of truce will be played on Wednesday in Aldershot, in front of the head of the British Army, the head of the FA and Sir Bobby Charlton. There is, however, still some debate about whether football actually featured in the 1914 truce. Taff Gillingham, a military historian who was recently an advisor to Sainsbury's in the making of their Christmas advert, which focuses on the 1914 truce, says new evidence discovered this year proves there was football during the truce. However, Professor Mark Connolly from the University of Kent says the evidence is too hazy to say with any kind of certainty that a match took place. You can read their comments in full at historyextra.com. Thanks, Emma. And now we have a short advertisement break. Which century saw the most change? And why does it matter? Most people would say the 20th century. Why? Atomic bombs, airplanes, computers, space travel and mobile phones. You would not believe how many people have told me that mobile phones have been the biggest changes in their lifetimes. However, what about law and order? It was in the 16th century that the murder rate started to fall from levels that would compare with the Wild West on a bad day. And what about medicine? In 1600, if you were seriously ill, you sent for a priest. 100 years later, you sent for a doctor and hoped that your fellow man, not God, would save you. There has never been a time when things were not changing rapidly. And of course, it hasn't stopped yet. It is only by looking back at the past that we can get an idea of where we're heading in the future. That's why it matters. Centuries of Change by Ian Mortimer. Out now. The 17th century sailor and adventurer Captain John Smith is well known for his dramatic encounters with Pocahontas. But the rest of his life remains largely forgotten. Our features editor, Charlotte Hodgman, caught up with Peter Firstbrook, author of a recent biography of Smith, to find out why, despite saving England's first permanent colony in the Americas from almost certain ruin, Smith is so often overlooked by historians. 
So, Peter, who exactly was John Smith, and, and how did he come to actually be in the Americas? John Smith was the eldest son of a tenant farmer from Lincolnshire. Now, that, that even today is a very remote part of eastern England. And back in 1580, it was a very remote part of England. He grew up, um, he went to school. Uh, his father somehow managed to find the resources to get him into petty school. In 1588, during the summer when the Spanish tried to invade uh, England with the Spanish Armada, uh, John Smith was fired up with enthusiasm. He was very adventurous, he was ambitious, and I, th I personally think that um, he was inspired by the, the roles of Walter Raleigh and Francis Drake and so on, um, Elizabeth's sea dogs in their defense of the realm in 1588. I mean, he did, he did um, have quite an exciting life, didn't he? And quite a lot happened to him before, you know, before even the age of 30. Can you sort of go through some of the events that, that, that he um, went through? Well, he was ambitious. Uh, his father sent him off to King's Lynn to be an apprentice, um, but his father died shortly after that, and John came home. And when his mother uh, remarried shortly after his father's death, uh, John was a free agent. He went out to the Low Countries and fought with the English army, who were then in support of the Dutch army, fighting the, uh, the Spanish Catholics um, of, of King Philip of Spain. Uh, he was out there for a couple of years, uh, came back, and then he decided decided that he'd had enough of fighting Christians and seeing Christians slaughter each other, and so he then traveled out to Eastern Europe to join the army of the Holy Roman Emperor, who was then fighting the Ottomans, which were a serious threat to the eastern borders of Europe. He traveled uh, through France. Um, he had a whole series of adventures before he eventually got out to um, Austria, where he did successfully join the army. The problem it the problem that he had was that he was an English Protestant, and the army itself was primarily Catholic. Um, however, he was eventually brought into a Protestant regiment uh, that was being formed, and he was sent off to fight the Ottomans in what is now Hungary and Transylvania. And was he a good soldier? When he first went out there, he was really very inexperienced. He'd obviously picked up some um, uh, experience in the Low Countries, uh, but he, um, over, the, over the first couple of battles, he did contribute a whole series of ideas, um, uh, signaling with Morse code, uh, using, making his own grenades from uh, clay canisters packed with gunpowder. This brought him to the attention of his commanding officer, and after his first engagement, in fact, he was promoted to the rank of captain, Captain John Smith, and put in charge of a company of 250 horsemen. Uh, many people think that John Smith's title of captain was actually a, a maritime uh, title. In fact, it was it was a soldier, it was a cavalry title. Mm. Uh, but it's probably his relationship with Pocahontas, isn't it, that he's probably best known for. Um, she allegedly saved his life. Um, I mean, how, a how accurate is actually that story? It is quite a difficult story to interpret. Um, the only re reference we have to it um, was John Smith himself. He did write about it on a couple of occasions after the event uh, because, of course, the, uh, the Powhatan people out in Virginia had no written language, so there was no record from them. Uh, John had been uh, captured by the native people and had been been marched from one village to another and inter interrogated over a couple of weeks. And he ended up in Werewakomoko, which was the capital town, the capital city of the local native chief. And here he was brought in before the assembled throng, and he was, his head was laid upon uh, some large blocks, and he lay there ready he thought to have his brains smashed out by the warriors standing over him with clubs. And then out of the gloom, out of the smoky gloom, uh, came this young girl of 12 or 13 who cast herself prostrate on John Smith's body. Uh, Pocahontas happened to be the favored daughter of the paramount chief, and she pleaded for his life, at least according to John Smith, and uh, his life was saved. This story didn't really come out until... 1616, uh, so we're now talking about 
uh, eight or nine years after the event. Uh, John, R- John Smith wrote about it for the first time when he wrote a letter to Queen Anne of England. This was on the occasion of Pocahontas actually coming to England um, with her new English husband, John Rolfe. And John Smith wrote a letter to Queen Anne, really as a briefing document, explaining to her who Pocahontas was. And in that letter, he explained that he'd been saved from execution by Pocahontas. In practice, he probably got the wrong end of the stick. He probably misunderstood entirely what was going on. He'd only been out in Virginia for about six months um, at that stage. He hadn't learned very much Algonquin, so everything that was being spoken around him, he didn't really fully understand. And we think that the most likely explanation is that the paramount chief, Pocahontas' father, uh, had decided that he wanted to bring the English colonists, there were about a hundred of them at the time in Jamestown, into his tribal empire. He was the paramount chief of about 30 tribes around the Chesapeake Bay area. And he really saw the English as, as yet another tribe, and John Smith... As, as one of their chieftains, their um, Werowats was is the name they called them. And the, the experience that John Smith had was probably an initiation into the tribe, whereby he was ritually killed and then reborn within the tribe. He therefore owed his life to the king, and as a consequence, he would owe him various tributes and allegiances. Um, but it seems... Certainly at first that, that John Smith did not understand that's what was going on. So it's not a case of him maybe exaggerating events after after the... Um... He has been criticised for uh, exaggerating the events. In fact, he has been criticised um, for, for, for writing a lot of things which were not, um, were not as some people believe, uh, true. The thing is, there seems to be no reason why he would actually exaggerate this particular event. He doesn't come out of it very well being saved by a 12-year-old tw- girl and, <laughs> and um, uh, because he was certainly um, an arrogant man. He was a, a, a fearless soldier and mercenary and it, there doesn't seem to be anything that he could have gained from actually making up the story. There are lots of reasons why he should have suppressed the story story in the first place, and maybe this explains why it took nine years before the the proper story came out. Uh, For example, when he went, sailed out in 1607 to Jamestown on the first occasion, uh, he hadn't been at sea for more than two or three weeks, and he was found guilty of treason of sedition uh, in, in practice he was just um, being, being very difficult uh, being very argumentative and people got fed up with him and snapped him in chains and charged him with treason but one of, one of the uh, accusations against him which was, which was ridiculous was that he planned to murder the leaders of the Jamestown colony um, and to command and to rule the settlement uh, with, with the native uh, uh, chief out there, and so he really didn't want to come back to Jamestown, having uh, survived this experience with with Pocahontas, and claim that he'd got some sort of special privileged treatment at all. It would have, would have done him no good at all. Hmm. So, why is it for this episode that he's remembered and, and not for his exploits as a, an explorer and a soldier? Well, there are there are two questions there. Why is he remembered for this, and why is he not remembered as a soldier? Um, I think the reason why he's remembered for this is that it did go down in um, early American history as really this great encounter between um, a fearless uh, English captain and it was always a beautiful uh, Indian native princess. Um, so it really became part of the mythology of the early English settlement of, of the Americas. The reason why he didn't become better known for his other exploits is is much more complicated to explain and, and really to understand. First of all, he never really was given the credit for what he did in the way that Francis Drake and, and um, Walter Raleigh did, for example. Uh, John Smith was never knighted. Uh, part of the reason for this, I think, is because he really was a young man and achieved all these things in his life, not in Elizabeth, Elizabeth's reign, but in that of King James I of England. Elizabeth tended to dish out her knighthoods um, quite, um, quite 
uh, willingly, and she also did attract sort of this uh, coterie of, of, of handsome, dashing young men that she she um, was rather rather taken to. Uh, James was altogether much more of a difficult man. The other thing was that John Smith came from really quite a lowly status. He was the son of a, a, a relatively poor tenant farmer, as indeed um, was was Francis Drake for that matter. Uh, but but. John Smith's problem, especially in his early adult life, was that he had this huge chip on his shoulder. He deeply resented um, the, the hierarchical status um, in England at that time, the, the fact that people had to be born into the right family, they had to have the right connections in order to progress through, uh, through the social hierarchy. And he went through life with a huge chip on his shoulder, um, really challenging people in authority. He was almost certainly um, more competent than they were, uh, and he wasn't afraid to let them know in no uncertain terms. And I think this really did exclude him from, from sort of the ranks of the, of the upwardly mobile. And people actually, although they respected him and what he achieved, uh, they also resented him. So, yeah, so he wasn't particularly, uh, he wasn't a favorite then um, amongst his contemporaries or anything like that. He did try very hard at, um, he did, for example, try and get into the court of uh, King James when he was uh, the Scottish king up in Edinburgh, even before he was crowned in, in London. Um, he failed at that. Uh, he was certainly trying, he, he was a tri- terrific networker. He did try and use what contacts he had. But he always seemed to have this habit of upsetting people and uh, getting on the wrong side of them. And I think that in the end worked, worked rather against him. Then later on in, in history, and I'm now going on decades and hundreds of years on, there was always in the back of historians' mind the fact that maybe he made up a lot of these things that he wrote about. He, he, his, um, his autobiography, The True Travels, um, he wrote in, uh, in 1629, and this was actually one of the very earliest autobiographies in the English language. So in that respect, as a, as a, a piece of literature, it is, it is really quite remarkable. But it does include the most extraordinary number of events. He was captured, he was enslaved, he murdered a slave owner, he was shipwrecked twice, he was marched to the gallows, um, only to be re- reprieved at the last minute, not once but twice. It's just one thing after another that do sa- seem to be almost impossible to believe that all these things happen to just one person. And for this reason, in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, a lot of historians really dismissed a lot of what he had and didn't, didn't believe what he wrote. Um, what I try to do in, in the new biography that I've written on John Smith is to retrace his footsteps and especially his time in Eastern Europe, which is by and large um, been ignored a lot by American biographers. And by literally walking, walking uh, his route with a GPS in one hand and his memoirs in the other, I was able to test what he wrote um, in his autobiography and in his other writings against the local geography and the local history, constantly trying to catch him out, trying to see whether, in fact, he was making it up or what he wrote was actually true. And on balance, I came away thinking that actually he did, he did write accurately. I did catch him out a couple of times, but you'd expect that after 400 years, things may not seem as, as crystal clear as they would have done at the time. Um, so I have caught him out a couple of occasions, but by and large, the vast majority of what he wrote, I think, is fair, a fair and accurate description of what he got up to. And that then really suggests that what he wrote about Pocahontas, for example, which has also been doubted by historians, uh, was also true, at least from his perspective. I mean, do we have any other evidence of his life? Is it, is it only his documents and his writings that, that historians have to rely on? Well, once, once you're out, uh, when you're out in Eastern Europe, um, on his adventures against the Ottomans, uh, you can tie in what he wrote against um, some of the history of the of the, the Ottoman wars um, in the early 17th century. And these were, especially in Transylvania, these were very complicated, very convoluted. People were constantly double double crossing each other. There were assassinations. Uh, people were joining armies, breaking away, and, and 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 joining the opposition. And what he wrote there does seem broadly to tie in with 
the the established history out in Romania and Transylvania and, and Hungary at this time. Of course, when he then went to Jamestown, there were other documentarists um, on uh, on board the ships and uh, as part of the early colony. Uh, there was uh, Edward Maria Wingfield who wrote uh, various uh, memoirs. Um, Gabriel Archer was uh, one of the recordists. George Percy, um, who's one of the aristocrats that went out there on the first, on the first uh, sailing, um, wrote a lot and wrote very well. And none of them contradicted what John Smith wrote. They didn't always include the same things that John Smith wrote about himself, um, and you wouldn't necessarily ex expect that because partly John was writing from his own perspective, but the other thing is they didn't really want to give him very much credit um, because they didn't like him very much. Um, they considered him to be an upstart, um, a difficult, truculent man, and so they didn't give him much benefit of, of, of the doubt. But, but certainly uh, there's nothing that John Smith wrote that they disputed, and even when he got back to London and all his memoirs were, were published, nobody challenged him that what he wrote was actually inaccurate. So by and large, what he wrote um, does tie in with what the other people, um, his contemporaries out in Jamestown were writing at the time as well. And Jamestown, he's actually credited with actually sort of saving, isn't he? I mean, that was England's first permanent colony in the Americas. Um, is, was that actually the case? You know, did he have such a big role in that? He, he actually had a very significant role in Jamestown. It was a pretty disastrous effort by the, by the English. And um, this was 13 years before um, the pilgrims sailed out to Plymouth. And so it was a very early settlement. Um, unlike the... Um, the, the, the pilgrims that went to Plymouth, the Jamestown settlement was all male, and they actually went out there to search for gold and to find a route west to the uh, riches of the South Seas. But of course, they failed pretty dismally um, with, with both of those particular um, attempts. And, and one of the problems was because they spent the whole time looking for gold, they didn't get round either to building proper houses, uh, they didn't get round to planting crops and harvesting. And so um, every winter there was a crisis of, with a, f a shortage of food. And John Smith was really the one person who was able to negotiate and to barter with the native people. And he was handing over trinkets and little bits of copper, not very much, uh, in return for hundreds of baskets of corn. And it was this food that kept the settlers in James town alive for the first two winters so he was very very um, instrumental in terms of keeping this this shaky badly organized and and and, and poorly run uh, settlement in virginia on the go and after the first year um, the settlers got really fed up with uh, the, they'd had three different presidents all of whom had been pretty incompetent in terms of running the settlement and they eventually elected john smith as the fourth president and he ran and the police, um, very much along military lines. He was very much more organized, he expected a lot more out of the men. He, he wouldn't allow the gentlemen uh, to shirk any, any work. They all had to roll their sleeves up and, and work just as hard as, as, as the laborers. And uh, really for the first, he was only out there for two and a half years, but he kept that place going. He eventually came back in the, um, the autumn of uh, 1609 and that first winter when he wasn't there is a period known as the starving time and at the time there were 500 colonists in Jamestown and by the spring only 60 survived they resorted to cannibalism they were eating poisonous snakes they'd eaten all their horses and their dogs everything was going as I say their numbers were reduced from 500 to 60 and that's what happened without John Smith's leadership so I think there's little doubt that had it not been for John Smith in his first two and a half years, Jamestown would actually have failed as a colony and would not have, would have, not, not have kept going. So do you think John Smith deserves to be remembered like men like Francis Drake and Walter Raleigh? Do you think he deserves to be up in the, in the Hall of Fame? I think he should be part of the Hall of Fame and it's very interesting that I, I, mean, I, I, ne I grew up at, at school doing my history lessons and never once heard about John Smith. Um, he has dropped um, off the edge of the, of, the, of the page of history books uh, in British schools. Over in um, uh, the, the States uh, he is taught in fourth grade. Everybody knows about John Smith. They of course know about Pocahontas and think they all had a, a romantic attachment which they didn't. So part of their history that they're taught is, is missing 
misunderstood, but he is certainly recognized as one of the great heroes of, of early Anglo-American history. And I think he should be up there with the great Elizabethan sea dogs, if for one reason and one reason only. John Smith, more than any other individual of the period, ended up uh, making North America become part of the English-speaking world rather than um, allowing the Spanish and the Dutch and the French from expanding. So John Smith really has been very, very instrumental in terms of um, the early establishment of the British Empire. That was Peter Firstbrook. Peter's book, A Man Most Driven, Captain John Smith, Pocahontas and the Founding of America, is on sale now in both the UK and the US, published by One World. Now, as regular listeners will know, we've been running a series in the magazine and the podcast this year called Our First World War that recalls the state of the conflict a hundred years beforehand. We've now reached December 1914, which of course witnessed the famous Christmas truce in the trenches. Here is George Ashurst of the 2nd Lancashire Fusiliers recalling those events in a later interview with the Imperial War Museum. It started by, well, Merry Christmas, lads, you know, talking in the trench, like that, and we can hear Jerry, he's chatting quite loudly this particular morning, and he starts to sing, Jerry, and he's singing a Christmas carol, you know, in German. And damn good singing, too, and we're shouting, God, Jerry, you know, Encore we're shouting, and a fellow come next, playing a cornet. Oh God, he was a good one too, and he was playing a, a carol with his cornet. We didn't half rattle out all them lands, you know, rattle out. It was beautiful to hear him play it. We were shouting, hooray, lad, Jerry, and we kept looking over, you know. There was nobody shooting. And uh, so we started shouting to him, you know. Merry Christmas, Jerry. And he shouted it back, you know. And uh, about, would it be about 11 o'clock? No, about 10 o'clock, something like that, in the morning, or half past. A Jerry's walking across. And he's a stick with a white flag on it, you know. And he's walking across towards our lines. Of course, when he gets halfway, he stops, which he has to do, you know. When he gets halfway with his flag, he stops. Waiting for somebody, has to go out and bring him in. You see? So we sent a fellow out, our lot. Went to him, met him, and brought him in. Well, he's a prisoner of war. When he gets in our lines, he's immediately a prisoner of war. We've got to keep him as a prisoner of war, and we have to tell him so. You see? Because he's not been blindfolded. That fellow that went out for him should have blindfolded him, and then brought him in. But he didn't. So our officers had to tell him that he was a prisoner of war. Best thing it were for him it was, you know, if he only knew it. And so he was kept as a prisoner of war. <clears throat> Anyhow, the message said, like, could we have an armistice of two hours? From a, 11 o'clock till 1. That's what the message was. And our people agreed. They sent a, a messenger back, you know, agreeing. That was George Ashurst. Keep up with the Our First World War series in the monthly editions of BBC History magazine. It took a break in the Christmas issue, but it will be returning next month. And just before we go, I'd like to read out a couple of messages from listeners that have come in recently. First, it's Phil Perry, who listens in Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. Phil writes, I have been an avid listener of the podcasts since you started the series with Dave Musgrove. I find both the magazine and the podcasts of real value out here in the Caribbean, where digital is vital to keeping in contact with the outside world. Thanks for that, Phil. And we also heard a little while back from Hayden Huffer in California. Hayden says, I was just listening to the Joan of Arc podcast, and I wanted to write to tell you how much I enjoyed the two historians, Dan Jones and Helen Castor, 
interviewing each other about Joan of Arc, and also the previous one about the Wars of the Roses. I'm very pleased to hear you might continue this format when it is appropriate. You guys do a fine job normally, but the historians get to ask some questions that a non-historian might not think to ask. Thank you for the podcasts, and keep up the great work. Thanks for that, Hayden. And if you'd like to listen to the episode about Joan of Arc, then it's still available for download from all the usual places, and it was released on the 2nd of October. And if you enjoy history podcasts, don't forget to download our new History of Britain special episode, available for free from our website. You'll find it at historyextra.com forward slash Britain podcast. You will need to be logged in to access it, but don't worry if you've not already registered, because it's free to do so and very simple. Well, that's pretty much it for this week. Do join us next time when we'll be getting in a festive mood with our annual Christmas quiz. I'm sure you won't want to miss it. Thanks for listening to this History Extra podcast, which was produced by Jack Fletcher. Do let us know what you think about this episode by emailing podcast at historyextra.com and we might read out your messages in future episodes. Alternatively, why not keep in touch via Twitter or Facebook, where you'll find us at History Extra. For more great history content, don't forget to visit our website, historyextra.com, where you will find history quizzes, galleries, articles, and more. Plus, it's where you can download every single previous episode of this podcast.